In the previous lesson, I narrated to you the inception years of DevOps. Let's now talk about how it evolved over the next five to six years, which I also call as the era of chaos. So as you've learned, 2009 was the time when DevOps as the word was coined to bring developers and operations together to achieve you know, faster deployments and to break the invisible wall between dev and ops. Now, the reason why I call this these years as era of chaos was there were just overwhelming set of choices. That was one. Second was this was the time when everybody wanted to do DevOps but nobody really knew what it really meant. And that was it also the reason why there were a lot of vendors pushing for their products as with label of DevOps and a lot of bad decisions were made in the process, you know, on, in those years, which is really sad because a lot of, you know, in a lot of cases uh, for a lot of organizations, things did not make sense at all but they still started using certain tools or they started uh, you know using the tools from certain vendors just because it was labeled as devops and they you know they had a fear of uh, you know being left out and that's the reason why i say that it was a era of chaos however a lot of interesting developments happened which would change the course of the software delivery in the later years one of the things that happened in those years was, um, you know, the Hudson that was a product uh, by created earlier um, at the Sun Microsystem. It was open source project which was created at there. Uh, when later on Oracle acquired Sun Microsystems, um, there were some issues in terms of uh, the legal issues in terms of using the copyrights and so on. So majority of the developers of Hudson, the community that is, uh, created a different version of it or created sort of uh, renamed that project to Jenkins and both both the projects Hudson would say hey Jenkins is our fork Jenkins would say Hudson is our fork and so on and so forth but there, those were two separate independent lines of development starting around in 2011 what emerged as the most popular choice as you know is where the community was leading uh, was Jenkins in the later years Around the same time, Michael Dehan, uh, who I, you know, I had mentioned about this fellow earlier when I spoke about Chef. So when Chef came out, uh, possibly Michael was thinking about was uh, probably would have been amused and would have been thinking about, hey, uh, you just created a, you know, a more sophisticated and complex puppet when you release Chef, right? Because it was a similar approach. And the reason why I think so is because Michael had already worked at Puppet. He had seen the problems at Puppet. And before that, in fact, he had created uh, in some interesting tools such as Cobbler and Funk uh, in, when, in, in when he was working at Red Hat's Advanced Technologies Group part, after which he had joined Puppet. He had seen the issues at Puppet and so on. And later on, in 2000, around 2012 was when he decided to take a completely different approach towards com, you know configuration management and decided to create something simple yet sophisticated and that was when ansible was born somewhere in 2012 in 2013 along with a couple more guys he formed a company around it called as ansible inc which was later on sold to or acquired by red hat in 2015 uh, LXC, the uh, you know what came out of uh, Linux kernels, namespaces, and C groups features were LXC. That was the story we spoke about, and a lot of companies started building. In two thousand and nine was the time when a lot of organizations started experimenting with and building their solutions on top of that. Now, one such company was called as Dot Cloud, which created a web based collaborative ID environment for developers where you could write the code in one of the windows and in another window you could execute it using a terminal session which was created and based on top of LXC. So by 2012 the end of it dot cloud was possibly just running out of funds and they were possibly not generating enough revenues with their product and what they decided to do at that time was the founder of dot cloud brought his team together 
and his name was Solomon Hikes and that should give you a clue that he brought his team together and they decided to open source their uh, one of their underlying technologies which was then named as Project Docker. And once they open sourced their technology, it became extremely popular. In fact, one of the most, you know, uh, fastest moving projects after 2013 was Docker. A lot of people started experimenting with Docker around uh, 2013. Uh, just like how I got started with Docker. At that time, I was part of a team, um, you know, building a uh, big data infrastructure and provisioning tool for it. We were using Chef at that time and we were running a lot of VMs to test our uh, code and we were using tools like Vagrant. I was working as a consultant at that time and one of our uh, one of the person from our team was like, hey, have you seen this new tool called as Docker, uh, which is much easier to set up our environment. It's much faster than running Vagrant and virtual machines. Why don't we try it out? And that's how I got into Docker and started experimenting with it. I would assume around the same time, a lot of people got interested into it and they saw the real advantage of Docker, which was much lighter, faster, and a lot of people would have started thinking about, hey, this is great for development. Why don't we extend it and start running our infrastructure with Docker instead of running it with VMs, which was what cloud was. Uh, it would be much faster and lightweight. Now, how do you do that was the question. And that was solved later in 2014 when Google decided to open source um, or create a project by name Kubernetes. In fact, there's a story around Kubernetes. So, the, you know, probably in 2000 and around 2013 was when um, some people at Google would have uh, had this possibly imaginary con conversation. Hey, why don't we do the world a favor? Docker is getting popular, but people don't know how to run it in production. And we have been running this for almost like eight years now. So why don't we show the world how to do it like Google? And that's when they started working on this project to make their system called as Borg more friendlier. A friendlier version of Borg, Borg, Borg was a Star Trek character, and there was a friendlier version of Borg by name Seven of Nine. So they named this project Seven of Nine, and later on they released it to the world with the name of Kubernetes. And that was also the reason why you see the seven spokes, uh, spokes in this Kubernetes wheels, because it was seven of nine was the name it came from between 2014 and 15 a lot of other developments happened it was not just kubernetes which was the option to run your containers in uh, work uh, workloads in production docker released its own orchestration engine called as swarm and then there was a very popular apache miso system which was being used since around 2009, it was quite popular. It had large scale installations and Apache Mesos was a hybrid orchestrator where you could run a Hadoop job along with a cron job along with a Spark job and so on and so forth. And they added the container orchestration feature and uh, the framework that they added that for, for that was called as Marathon. So we had three main options, Kubernetes, Swarm and Marathon. And this was also the reason why I call this the era of chaos, because we had too many choices when it came to container orchestrations. A lot of organizations were con you know, confused between which one to choose amongst these three. And then there was a configuration management system where Puppet and Chef was already popular. And then there was another tool, Python based tool called a salt stack. And then came Ansible as well. So now we had a confusion Oh, which one to pick between these ones as well. Uh, we had many options for continuous integration as well. But continuous integration wise, I would say you, we always knew who is the boss and which has always been Jenkins, even though a lot of organizations use tools such as Bamboo and go for certain features, spe specific features or hosted versions of continuous integration like Travis and CircleCI, which are very interesting as well. But if you look at the usage in general and the community, it is the Jenkins, which probably has the wide, most widespread impact in the world of continuous integration. Right. So that was the era of chaos, which I call from 2010 to 2015 period, I would say. And in the next lesson, I'm going to talk about how DevOps matured 
and where we are at today and how does it really look like.